So a reminder that if you do want to, um, you know, type any questions into the chat box, I'm happy to answer them as we go along. Um, also, if you want to leave an anonymous message, or if you would rather your name not show up in the chat box, you can text today or, or email rather dwagner at centerforhealthdesex.com. So as I said, um, today's topic is Pillow Talk, and our quote today is from Judy Garland, um, who was a great and interesting artist, and she says, in the silence of the night, I have often wished for just a few words of love from one man, rather than the applause of thousands of people. And when you think about, um, first of all, the thousands of people that gave her accolades, and uh, this is often true for many people who are celebrities, they are you know, seeking validation and getting applause from many, many people. And all of us can have that experience in our own workaday worlds. But the desire to have one person give us their undivided attention, to share their most vulnerable, sweet selves with us, um, can shift and change who we are and how we feel about ourselves and um, not just ourselves, but our connection to this big, broad world that we live in that can sometimes feel so um, incredibly anonymous. So I like that quote a lot. I think it really does speak to um, the concept of intimacy. So when I think about pillow talk, I think about what we share in bed and how um, our beds can be the most um, comforting place in the world. Even if you're traveling and you're staying in nice beds or nice places or even sleeping on the beach or camping, there's always something about returning home to one's bed. And so we share more than just skin in bed or orgasms or touch or um, you know other things. It's, it's the truth that often comes out uh, when we're in that most vulnerable state, whether it's upon waking or prior to sleeping, or after we've connected through lovemaking, um, or there can be this sort of open-hearted pillow talk. Um, and that talk often complements sex and eroticism. And one of the um, great pains, I think, of anonymous sex, which can also be really fun and athletically exciting and great sex, um, and you know that that's what you're getting in for. And afterwards, you pick up your things and you leave or you hope the other person goes, whatever it might be. Um, the, the problem, the downside of that is often it can leave the person feeling awkward or, un, or lonely or you're wishing that person would leave. You really don't want that stranger in your bed that you just had sex with. And so you don't get to have that tender pillow talk with somebody that you don't know. So you're giving up really the athleticism and the orgasm um, for the intimacy, or you're giving up the intimacy for that, I should say. Um, and so adult play is, is essential for um, fun sex, for sex to feel um, playful and alive and to have a, a vitality to it that often doesn't happen when you don't know the person very well. And um, play, sex is a play state. And um, we want to see if we can cultivate that. And oftentimes, um, talking afterwards, pillow talk is what can engender that. And when lovers feel completely um, unabashed, uh, when they're basking in each other's adoration and presence and appreciation, um, it makes for the possibility for childlike states. And a lot of people get really creeped out by this notion of childlike states uh, because they want to make it fetishistic. They want to turn it into like baby play or diaper fetishes or things of that nature. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about uh, a really beautiful vulnerability that lets us be our uh, what my friend Marilyn Murray calls our original child, that unvarnished, sweet, goofy, playful, um, sometimes little girlish or little boyish just way of being because we all want that kind of nurturing and that kind of care. And typically that's not what gets advertised with being sexy. And uh, people can get really turned off or allergic 
to that kind of close and quietness um, because they're afraid of that sort of vulnerability themselves. Um, so think about the times when you've let yourself be in that childlike state and what you share and also what your partners share with you and how you can use that as a way to get to know somebody deeply because the intimacy of that one person is what Judy Garland was pointing to, um, that deep closeness. So um, if anybody has any questions, please remember to um, type those into the chat bar. Um, and you'll see that messages are coming up from Center for Healthy Sex right now to ask questions. Also, if you have questions about sex or sexuality, about talking to um, a therapist at Center for Healthy Sex or somewhere in your town, feel free to call our intake line at 310-843-9902 and someone's standing by to take your call now. Um, so before children learn to talk, um, they murmur and they babble. And this preverbal stage is certainly a vulnerable one. Uh, we also know that children babble in their uh, native language. So, um, you know, it turns out French babies babble on an up note and German babies uh, babble on a down note. Um, so we are already attempting to make contact um, to be um, uh, in communication with each other in the most vulnerable way possible. And this experimental babbling can show how the toddler um, feels. And typically, if they're babbling away, that means they feel safe and there's trust in the environment. Um, so they're willing to experiment more and more with who they are. And it's through this trust that the child takes emotional risks and the opportunities to grow and um, they start to experiment with the musicality of their voice. And of course, language ensues from that. And so similarly, you know, I'm making an association here between developmental stages that it's possible that in pillow talk, um, which is also, you know, in adulthood, that this is a way to build a relational vocabulary. Um, the, it actually is a place for expressive skills for deeper and more meaningful communication with the partner. That's not just conversation, but that's nonverbal communication. You know, when couples have been together for a long time, they can have their own special language, their own secret goofy language with each other that speaks to that sort of deep knowing and vulnerability. Um, it's why people have pet names for each other, um, why certainly I have a million pet names for my cat. Um, because those nicknames, those pet names speak to a high level of affection and closeness with each other. Um, so I'm looking to see if there are any questions. Um, and so far, I don't see anything. So a reminder that if you do have questions, feel free to type them into the chat box. So we want to build this vocation, this uh, relational vocabulary in adulthood so we can um, have more and deeper um, co uh, connection with our partner. And people often talk about wanting intimacy, but they will talk about intimacy um, because they really mean sexuality. Uh, but they're not talking about the intimacy that comes from this sort of close-in, um, sweet, um, conversations with each other. And that's what I think is important to cultivate so that we're not just, you know, defended with our adult selves or our adult personas uh, when we're in the sexual arena. And Pillow Talk also develops a kind of couple consciousness, which blends the consciousness of each person as an individual with the collective consciousness of the couple. And each couple has their own unique collective consciousness that they build together. And that creates a strength in that vulnerability um, and a deep and profound uh, connection. And like every individual, um, healthy relationships progress through certain stages. So it may take a while before people start to reveal themselves in that way, to make themselves more vulnerable. You know, in the first three months, everybody's on their best behavior and they're attempting to um, sort of show up in this 
kind of sometimes uber sexy way or way they think they the other person wants them to show up and wants them to look. Um, and very rarely do people sort of show up as their natural, most childlike, most vulnerable self right off the bat. Um, but over time, as defenses start to come down, as we start to trust the other person, hopefully these aspects of ourselves start to come forward too. And the more we invite pillow talk through shared trust and appreciation, the more our relationship nurtures its own meaningful and distinctive language, as I was saying, the more uh, safe we um, can become in, you know, the language of love or words that we make up together or goofy little sayings and things that we do. And it's really important that when our partners start to show that aspect of themselves that we not ridicule them or shame them or shut them down um, because that starts to really destabilize the foundation of the relationship. So recognize your own desire to show that vulnerability yourself and recognize when your partner shows that vulnerability um, how you treat it, if you become um, aggressive or if you're put off by it or if you're shaming in some ways, what does that say about your capacity for intimacy um, more than what does it say about the other person? Um, instead of seeing them as you know cute or sweet um, or goofy, instead you feel hostile towards them or you know I've had people say, well, I, I don't want to see my a partner looking that way. I don't want. I don't want to see them, you know, looking like a child or being that vulnerable because it's not a turn on. And that's really more about our difficulty with intimacy than the other person not being quote a turn on. So the more we invite pillow talk through shared trust and appreciation, the more our relationship. Um, uh, keeps nurturing itself and that language. And this bond of this kind of authentic private language can fulfill lovers in a very deep way. And it, it can be inspiring um, to those outside of the relationship, not because they see those intimate moments, but they feel the intimacy between the two of you when you're together. Um, it also has you remembering each other, not just in, um, you know, sometimes if you have like great sex on a weekend, on Monday morning, you can be thinking about or uh, remembering, you know, images from that sex. But also it has you remembering your partner in sweet and kind and vulnerable ways. So someone says, uh, Alex, the very thing you're speaking about um, the vulnerability required for emotional intimacy was the very thing that was destroyed upon learning of my husband's sex addiction, of course. Um, this betrayal, as I experienced it, literally changed my brain in regard to trust and vulnerability. How I held my former in with a new first person, it feels profoundly risky. Okay. Um, so there's no quick answer to your question. Um, when people are betrayed, there are a whole host of things that happen, both neurochemically and psychologically and in the body um, that are quite debilitating. And it will leave you being skittish about trusting again. And it's really most challenging for the person who's been betrayed to trust again, not the cheater, because the cheater is the cheater, the liar is the liar. Um, it's the person who's been on the receiving end of the intimate betrayal that suffers the most, I think. And all you can do is rebuild your psyche one block at a time, um, likewise with your sexuality. And you have to devise a system for choosing well, for screening people. And I also know that's incredibly difficult today because people lie about all sorts of things and we think we know somebody and we really don't. But we wanna look at our own psychology first and say, where do I engage in self-deceit? When do I let myself think something's better than it really is? Or when do I make assumptions and not ask obvious questions? Um, I know I myself am guilty about this, where I don't ask the obvious because I think, well, doesn't everybody know that? Or doesn't everybody do that? And I would say the answer is no, they don't. And 
one of the things that's crucial is that when you're dating somebody that you meet their friends and family um, and you ask people about who this person is and you pay attention to their behavior and notice <clears throat> really just how they show up. I think all too quickly, we take cursory glances at these things. We don't look in great detail. So does this person have a community of friends, whether it's a 12-step fellowship, a church, um, some sort of communal organization where a bunch of people know this person and they've known them for a long time so they can attest to the person's character? Um, how do they relate to their family members? How do they treat other men or other women? Um, and what do you see their relationships like? And do they do what they say they're going to do? Um, I find that more often than not today, people don't follow through on their commitments. They'll say they want to do something, but then they get into the actual experience of it and it's too much for them or they don't agree with it. And rather than being honest with it, they will just bail out of whatever the commitment or the agreement is. So how does this person handle themselves? How do they show up for you? If they say they're going to call, do they call? Um, what is your experience of them? And are you asking detailed and specific questions? And then you have to proceed with caution. Um, and let that person know also that this is that trust is very difficult for you because of that and see how they show up. Do they shame you? Do they blame you? Um, do they discount this? Or are they scrupulous about keeping their word? Um, and then Tom says, will you talk about intimacy or what intimacy is and is it developmental? Well, I think uh, that's a, a good question because Intimacy is one of these amorphous concepts or abstract concepts that has to do with cl being close in with someone. And there's a, a little um, ditty or adage that says uh, intimacy is defined as into me see. So I have to know myself first and foremost before I can ever be close to someone else. What do I like? What don't I like? Um, what kind of reaction do I have to certain suggestions, ideas about sex and sexuality or love or values um, or whatever it is? What are my opinions? What do I know about myself? And do I risk telling other people the truth about that? Or do I speak in metaphor or flowery language? Or am I evasive because I'm just going along to get along? And I do think it is a developmental task. I think we learn intimacy in our families of origin based on how honest um, the people we grow up with are. So if they model truth, if they model an interest in um, who we are, then we will grow up to expect that other people will be interested in who we are, that other people um, are going to want to know us, and they're going to be um, grateful about our curiosity instead of finding that invasive or um, like we're too needy or something along those lines. So how close can you get with yourself? How truthful are you about what you want in a partner in terms of their appearance, their intellect, their sense of humor, their spirituality, their lifestyle, their value system about money? Um, and are you really intentionally vetting people in this way? Or do you overlook things that you think you'll be able to get along with later because you're just so blinded by love? Um, or is that where you lie to yourself? Because I think we all engage in a lot of self-deceit. And then oftentimes we want to blame the other person for lying when they never really misrepresented themselves. We just wanted to give them um, some big benefit of the doubt, or we made assumptions that we didn't check out. So be intentional, be explicit, uh, check out what's really true for you, and then let the other person know. Um, and that will help you with not having these uh, surprises. Um, so Lee writes, I have pied, and I don't know if that means uh, planned 
intimacy, if that comes from the Burkhaz book, um, I can't remember what it stands for right now, but I know it has to do with planned intimacy. Um, I've been abstinent for 220 days using the tools I learned from Sex and Porn Addicts Anonymous, but I still can't get an erection with my wife. I've tried to touch myself a month ago and I was able to get an erection. Any suggestion? So I don't know how to give you suggestions based on that little description. Um, if you can get an erection, but you can't with your wife, there is something not being talked about between you and your wife. And maybe you're not being honest with yourself about your level of attraction to her um, and what has you losing attraction. Um, and if you are attracted, where your anxiety is and where you are getting in your own way. But there is something happening where you are in your own way and it's because you're not rigorously honest. And sometimes we're afraid to talk about our lack of attraction to our partner because we don't want to hurt that person. But my feeling is by not talking about it, we're hurting that person because we're lying and we're avoiding and we're evasive and we're doing all these workarounds and that person's trying to figure out what's going on and, and because they don't know. And sometimes it's really difficult to hear from your partner that they're not attracted to you. But it's honest and it doesn't even mean that it's personal because if you know that you are um, taking care of yourself, that you're sleeping well and eating well and you exercise and you're doing the best you can for your age and your body and you feel good about yourself, then if your partner says they're not attracted, oh well, there's only so much you can do. Now, if your teeth are rotting and you don't go to the dentist and you have bad breath, there's something you can do about that. Um, if you are you know, terribly overweight and you know it and you don't want to do anything about it and your partner's not attracted to you, then there's something you can do about that too. But at some point, you can't change your brown eyes. Um, you can't change that you're tall or petite and make yourself the opposite. There are only so many things we can do. So I think that you need to um, look deeply into yourself and ask yourself where the disconnect is for you with your partner and then what is it that you're not talking about that you need to talk about and these difficult conversations while difficult often lead to um, in, um, to intimacy okay so you said porn induced erectile dysfunction um, that I've seen that acronym used for other things as well so sorry about that so it sounds like you have gotten over that by way of abstaining and that you can get an erection with yourself, in which case you may have expectations about what your wife should look like or she should be doing sexually. Um, so you haven't really worked on getting present with yourself in therapy and kind of taken a deeper look at what is sexually arousing to you and what isn't. That would be one of my guesses. But again, I don't know you, so it's hard to say. Um, somebody writes, I am interested in connecting by way of pillow talk, which is the afterglow of lovemaking, and the verbal expression that occurs during lovemaking. Anything that comes to mind, I would love to hear. Um, so I'm not sure about what that question is. Um, so I, I don't know what comes to mind. But I would ask you what comes um, what kind of things do you like to talk about during sex? What are the things that are arousing for you to say or hear during sex? And do you tell your partner about that? Because um, talking during sex can be incredibly erotic. Um, you know, it ranges from, you know, the beautiful and the sublime and the um, sexy and sensual to um, the dirty and um, more um, sort of carnal language that can be highly arousing to the brain. So I would suggest that you think about or experiment with different things to see what turns you on um, and then try that with your partner. Um, someone says, I'm in a new relationship and we've been together for three and a half months so we're still in the best behavior stage and I'm finding myself to be a superwoman and it's a comfortable role for me but I feel that it's time to get deeper in our intimacy and it would require opening up and expressing my vulnerability. That's scary and uncomfortable. Well, sure, I mean, if you hide behind superwoman, um, it's hard for uh, the other person to see that you are fallible and that you're a human being and that your heart can be broken um, and that you're not all perfectly put together. 
Um, so you're asking for recommendations on the steps of how to do it or maybe books or resources where I can find more. Well, I would suggest that you just do it, um, that you, you know, look at where you've been superwoman. So I don't know if you're doing that um, in relation to how you're showing up in the relationship or sexually or both, but what would happen if you weren't so super about the whole thing? What if you um, weren't perfectly put together on a date and you looked more natural or more like your regular self? Or what if you talked about sex over dinner um, because you've been seeing each other for three and a half months and you talked about the kind of sex you were having and what you both like and don't like about it. And then you talk about, you know, what you would like that you haven't experienced or that you don't always feel like um, you want sex to be uh, super physical, maybe, or what I call athletic, um, that you want to be more receptive, more submissive, um, less active, more passive. And what would that be like for your partner? And this is where intimacy comes into play. It's through these explicit conversations, which, you know, most of us aren't educated about sex and sexuality in this way. And so we just make things up by way of movies, uh, especially film, um, and porn. And we think that if we just replicate those images of um, sort of this torrid, hot, um, you know, kind of highly sexual, arousing ways of being sexual, that that's just the way to be all the time. And there's a lack of humanity in that. There's certainly a lack of vulnerability in that because it can all look like a performance. And when we get real, um, when we're really in our humanity, uh, this takes us kind of back to the last person's question because um, he's relating to his wife now, but not as a pixelated pornographic image, but as a real live flesh and blood human being that sometimes can feel familiar and not that hot and not that exciting. But you have to find the novelty and the novelty, one of the ways the novelty is found is through these difficult conversations with each other about our fears, about our fear of losing, about being left, about not being lovable. Like if I'm not superwoman in bed all the time, I'm worried that you won't want to be with me. And that's a tricky thing to say to somebody you've been dating for three and a half months, but it's honest. And depending on how that person answers that statement, tells you whether you want to be with that person over time or not. Because if they are dismissive um, or if they are devaluing of you, then you should quit while you're ahead because that telegraphs to you the way you're going to be treated down the road. And if that person is understanding and they're curious and they want to know more and they want to see that vulnerable part of you, then um, that's a green light for you to keep going further into the relationship. So don't be afraid. Um, and that's one of the paradoxes is that uh, sex can be a very vulnerable, very scary arena to play in, but we also have to be fearless about our truth. And that even goes if you want to, let's say, be more dominant, um, then you have to talk about that also. And make sure that your partner understands what that means because it might scare them or maybe they don't want to participate in that kind of sexuality. And better for you to know than to coerce somebody into doing something they don't really want to do or they say they understand um, what you're talking about, but they really don't. So um, you want to sort these things out ahead of time. Um, so that you don't keep getting deeper into a relationship that ultimately is not what you want. Some of the things we talk about in Mirror of Intimacy for practicing this is to set a sacred space uh, for pillow talk. And that requires kind of having a relaxed approach to it. Um, you can't impose... Um, these moments. Um, I think these heartfelt moments um, sort of emerge naturally between the two. So, you know, if after you've had sex, you know, you have a candle going or um, you want to bring something to bed to eat, like a snack, you know, grapes or 
uh, whatever, some ice cream or a glass of wine or champagne. That sort of sets the stage for saying, hey, we're just kind of hanging out in bed, um, kind of cuddling, kind of having something yummy to eat and just kind of checking in with each other. And, you know, watching your body language, uh, um, observing and paying attention to your partner's emotional anxiety um, or energy rather, not anxiety. There could be anxiety there, so pay attention to that. And, you know, looking to see whether you're inviting receptivity or negativity or judgment, um, or if your partner does that, and then asking them about it. Because usually when people are dismissive or um, they make a joke about something, it's out of their anxiety. It's not just because they're being jerks. It's because they're scared or they're uncomfortable. So you want to be curious about that discomfort and even maybe say, you know, this is hard for me too, or I've never done this before. Or, I've never been this honest with somebody and it's really important to me. Um, and I'm trusting you to be honest with you right now. And, um, I just need you to, you know, be present with me. And if this feels too much for you, then just let me know. It's okay. And then that's information for you to determine what you want to do with the relationship going forward. So you want to build trust with your partner by showing appreciation and affection. You know, sometimes people say, well, my partner's not that romantic, or they're not that loving, or they're not that affectionate. And the first question I ask is, well, how affectionate are you? How loving are you? How honest and open and vulnerable are you? So we have to set the stage for what we want. Otherwise, we're victims or we're waiting for somebody to mind read uh, what we want and need. So you want to take the initiative and carry that energy for appreciation and gratitude and pay attention to sounds and feelings um, after any kind of engagement with people during your day to day. Um, you know, sometimes I notice walking down the street, I'll say hello to somebody and they just don't make eye contact and say hello. And the other day I was walking to work in the morning and a woman nearly knocked me over with saying good morning. I mean, she was just so full of good morning and I was almost caught off guard. Um, and I said good morning to her and she made me smile. And I thought, wow, that was so nice as opposed to the people that just kind of grumble or look the other way or, you know, they're too lost in their own heads to make any kind of social contact. So practice your intimacy um, in all areas of your life, at the people behind checkout counters, at the person at the car wash, um, make on eye contact, be grateful, you know, acknowledge that human being because they're doing their job on any given day. And we're all stressed out, tired, uncomfortable, feeling isolated. So why not? I mean, what does it really cost us to come out of our little avoidant bubbles and say hello to somebody? Um, and when two hearts come together for sexual intimacy or casual friendship or ordinary dealings, there's always an opportunity to mutually share with that person. Um, I had an exchange like that last night in a supermarket where I was asking the woman if they had any rotisserie chickens left. And it was late at night and she said no. And she proceeded to give me a whole spiel about how to get chickens, what time they finish roasting them on Sunday nights, what time I should call. I mean, she started giving me way more information than I wanted in that moment. And I could have been annoyed because I wanted to keep going with my grocery shopping, but instead I just stopped and I looked at her and I made eye contact with her and I thought, wow, this woman is really wanting to give customer service to me. And so rather than brushing her off, I'm going to listen to her and thank her for the tip. Um, and even though it's a grocery store I don't go to regularly, I probably won't go back there. So the tips were kind of useless. Um, it didn't hurt me to spend two minutes listening to her. And so that um, is the kind of way that we can practice intimacy um, every day of our lives. Um, so Lee writes back and says, I've been married for 26 years. I don't know what to say to my wife about sex. I don't know what I want because there are so many judgments in my mind. My mind is full of pornography ideas in regard to sex. I feel stuck in uh, regards to figure out what I want sexually. So as a result of sounding, you know, shamelessly self-promotional, I want to turn your attention to my new workbook called Sexual Reflections. 
Um, and that is a workbook specifically for people who are in recovery from sex and pornography addiction um, to get very clear about what they do and don't like sexually. Um, this is for people that have been in program for at least eight months to a year. Um, it's recommended that you work on it with a therapist. There are therapist guidelines in the book. Uh, you can buy the book on Amazon and um, it's way too much to try and help any one person on a call like this figure out who they are sexually. It really is something that you should spend as long as you spent on, on your recovery by really asking yourself questions about who am I, what do I like, what resonates in my body, what feels good, what feels toxic, what feels you know like it's in my addiction versus makes me feel healthy and alive sexually. Um, and I noticed that Doug just typed in the URL for sexual reflections, which you can buy on Amazon. Um, but make sure that you talk to your therapist about working through it with you uh, so you're not doing it by yourself. So today I want you to let the language of all your relationships develop through um, a gentle kind of expression of warm regard for other people, of eye contact, um, of ways that feel open-hearted, that feel sort of like pillow talk. Um, and notice the difference in how you feel in terms of your vulnerability. And that doesn't mean that you, you know, make contact with a stranger on the street and start talking to them about your sexuality. It means that you smile, you have a moment with that person, um, you feel their humanity and you let them feel yours. And even if there's a tinge of sexual excitement to it, then you just let that be. You don't make a story about it. You don't go into sexual fantasy or intrigue about them if you're in recovery from sex addiction, um, nor do you block them out. You let your se sexuality and your sensuality uh, be alive and be a place of open-heartedness so that you can touch the world with love and kindness and affection. So I hope this uh, conversation on Pillow Talk was useful to you today. I wanna to remind you that you can find Mirror of Intimacy on amazon.com as well as Sexual Reflections. And as always, if there is a review you wanna write about one of these books, I love hearing from you and appreciate your support. Um, and I apologize for the odd video glitches today. Hopefully those will be smoothed out next time we meet. So I hope you have a wonderful June. I hope you engage in lots of pillow talk and I look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you.